All right, so we're here to talk a little bit about the pelvic floor and see what kinds of things we can explore in the body that are gonna help us kind of all the time as opposed to just during some exercise time. Um, and the reason we're talking pelvic floor, it has a lot to do with the fact that many of the women that I encounter in my work, many of the reasons that people come to this work is because of pelvic floor stuff. So that could be sneeze, pee, you know, the intermittent incontinence, um, or it could be full-on pelvic organ prolapse. Um, and what I've seen is that we treat this in our culture like, well, this is just a normal experience of being a woman, or being a woman who's getting older, or being a woman who's going through pregnancy or the postpartum period. This doesn't have to be how you experience your body. Um, there are lots of things we can do to either you know, entirely repair these problems or to get them well on their way. Um, a lot of women, for instance, with pelvic or organ prolapse become entirely asymptomatic. So let's look into that a little bit. Um, the first thing we're going to look at is how we stand, which is going to connect a lot to how we walk. Um, so we teach, you know, in, um, move this camera a little bit. We teach in sort of basic alignment work, a basic stance, but the point isn't to just stand around still. Um, we want to apply this to our exercise and to uh, walking and to understanding how, you know, kind of using it as an assessment, where does my body need some help? So the first thing we do is we, you know, check, so just notice how you're standing, right? <laughs> what is it the normal way that you use your body? Now I'm going to have you bring your ankles underneath your pelvis. So this may be something that you can see with your eyes, but my guess is you're going to want to be in the mirror and that you may want to drop a plumb line down or use a strap, if you're pregnant like me, you can't, but to use a strap to measure from here, or what is the distance between these two frontal bones, your ASIS, and what is the distance between the center of your ankles. So we're trying to get this basic stance here. And then we want to check in with the feet. Are they turned out? Are they turned in? How can we get them going straight so that the outside edges, for most people, are going to be parallel to each other? So this is really your basic stance from the front. And then we want to turn to the side. And maybe this feels awkward, and maybe you need to turn your feet out a little bit, and that's OK, too. But once you've gotten that, notice where your pelvis falls. So most of the time, and I see this almost every time in women with pelvic floor problems, the hips come in front of the ankle. And that almost always is tucking the pelvis under. And so generally, if we can just back up the hips, and you may or may not have the glute strength and the openness through the backs of the legs at this time to be able to do that. But when we are able to back the hips up, the pelvis will untuck and fall into a more neutral position. So we want these two bones, again, that we just talked about, if they had a line, in your pubic symphysis, we put those clearly in a line, they would be um, stacked, the ASIs would be stacked over your pubic symphysis, as opposed to pubic symphysis leading or your ASIS leading. So we want to get that nice vertical line from the outside of your hip down to your ankle. It's really, really important. Like because you know, just the legs, the legs are connected to your pelvis. Did you know that? <laughs> and so what's kind of happening with them and how you use them throughout your day makes a big difference. Um, and because the pelvis will often move with the legs, right? We don't, as I come forward, my pelvis tucks under, and as I go back, it rolls forward that we want to be able to find that place where where can the pelvis be neutral? Because what we want is the pelvic floor to be in the place where it belongs, not in some other less force generating place. We want it to be most supportive. You don't want a hammock tilted to the side, right? You want it really stable underneath you. So the same neutral pelvis stuff applies to sitting. So when you sit, and this is hard in our modern <laughs> we have a lot of things that make us sit like this right so this 
it's really common to have kind of a rounded back and even, even slightly, right? So can we bring the body forward from the pelvis untuck? Do we have the length and the hamstrings, the ability to hip flex so that the pelvis can instead be neutral? So that we're still in that place where the pelvic floor is in a more optimal relationship with what's below it, what's above it, with gravity. Understanding that what we really want is to move all of the time and that relationship's changing. But if we're gonna be in these kind of still sedentary places, then we wanna at least be able to get here. So if you find that this is hard in your body, that you're like having to bring your ribs or tense your back, what you may be noticing is that there's enough tension through the hips and the legs that for you to sit and have a neutral pelvis might mean that you need to come higher, right? Or might mean that you need to straighten your legs. Often the straightening of the legs will alleviate that. And suddenly it's really easy to be in this stacked position. So you can see what that feels like. You know, notice how often you do this, probably in your car. <laughs> can you come forward? Um, and then when you're thinking about this in your day to day, how can you support yourself so that when you are sitting, um, and you, if you have a pelvic floor problem, how can you get your pelvis into more of a neutral position? Understand a neutral pelvis isn't like, isn't for every single moment of your day, but can you get there? And what would it be like to spend time in this position? So the next big thing I want to talk about is the rib cage. Um, so, um, all right. So most of us, and actually, let me start sitting because I think this is a perfect example. When you're seated and you want to bring your pelvis, so like say like you're like this, and you want to bring your pelvis forward, it's really common to lead with the ribs. Yeah. And so maybe you can feel that coming up with the ribs, and. And in this position, with the rib cage lifted, right, which we think of as like nice straight back, this is often moving our core into a position in which it's least stable, and our core is really connected to our pelvic floor. So what we want is to be able to say, have the pelvis untucked and the rib cage dropped. And you'll see that that doesn't move my pelvis in any, my shirt moves a little bit, but my pelvis isn't tucking under here. So one of the things that I really work on with women who are dealing with pelvic floor stuff is can you drop the ribs? And again, you may or may not be able to find that movement in your body today based on your own stuff, your movement habits, kind of some awareness of what's happening in your body. But that's gonna mean that you're, it's gonna mean two really important things. So one is your core is able to function better. And while you're here, can you let the belly relax? I can. I can let the sucker hang out. <laughs> but really, like, you know, it's not pregnant when it's sucking all the time. Like, we hold this constant tension. And so, can you let it go, pregnant or not? Keeping the rib cage down. It might feel uncomfortable. You can do this standing as well. One of the main benefits of this so, not only are you just aligning the whole body better, you know. And yeah, I want to be clear that you're going to see some curvature in your spine probably. Your head's going to come a little bit forward as you allow the rib cage down. That's a different problem. We don't want to, we don't want to fix this problem by shearing the spine, by moving the vertebra, you know, um, in ways that kind of constantly holding them in a position that they're not intended to be constantly held at, which is, you know, then we stay stiff here and we just have this kind of super mobility at this one spot in our rib cage. But the really amazing thing about getting the ribs relaxed down is that we suddenly have access to this part of the back for breath. So when you're dealing with pelvic floor stuff, you're often experiencing with every single breath sort of this plunge down onto a pelvic floor that's often not well aligned. And so you have all of this kind of force going downward that could be going outward in your rib cage. And that force is hitting your pelvic floor usually at an angle at which is like not optimal, especially if there's some sort of dysfunction there. 
And so one of the simplest things we can do is to drop that rib cage and allow breath into the back and the sides of the body. When we create space, again, like there's like doing a lot of hanging work, you know, learning how to mobilize and getting these intercostals to lengthen and have, you know, like when the, when the, we need to do exercise to get mobility here. But sometimes even just dropping that ribcage, we suddenly have space. And all the exercise in the world won't make a difference to creating that space if we're continually um, positioning our body in a way that limits access. So go ahead. Let yourself be slouched for the sake of your core, for the sake of your pelvic floor, maybe even for the sake of your awareness about how you're hiding your thoracic and cervical malalignment. And let the breath come into the back of the body. So that's going to decrease the downward force. Yeah? And if you combine that with a pelvis that is now better aligned most of the time, then you are not only decreasing the amount of force and increasing the capacity of your thoracic cavity, but you are um, supporting the force that is coming down with a pelvic floor that is in a, in a more optimal position. And so let's talk a little bit just about the pelvic floor directly. Um, so you, just like we relaxed the belly, I want you to tune in, if you can, and sometimes I, you know, it takes, it can take a while to find, even sense the pelvic floor. But can you, it's sort of like if you've had to pee, you know, if you have to relax. So can you relax more than you are right now without peeing? Um, because in that same way that we often hold that chronic abdominal tension, we're often holding chronic pelvic floor tension. And so we, for many people, the pelvic floor is like a fist. And we want to re, re, res, uh, restore the ability for a full lengthening of it, like the ability to open. And so if your pelvic floor is like this, then maybe you can get to here, and maybe here, and maybe here, you know? So taking a moment to tune in and sensing what is happening and seeing if you could just relax a little bit, let some of that tension go. Um, and that, by the way, is a big part of the Kegel. For those of you who are curious about that, it's a big part of the Kegel thing. You know, it's like so many people have, um, it's like you can be incontinent and your pelvic floor can be like this. You know, you can have sneeze pee and your pelvic floor is super, super tight. And the Kegel, you know, is just like trying to tighten the fist all the more. And so what we want is, um, is to be able to, again, restore full mobility not just make everything harder and tighter in that regard. Um, so I want to say a couple of things, because, you know, this is really, this is deep, like, heart body work for most women, that when we we're dealing with pelvic floor stuff, this kind of just do a bunch of corrective exercises or even change these lifestyle habits, and finding creates a certain disconnect that there's, this is a really powerful part of a woman's body, and it's a very sensitive part, and it's a part that's devalued and diminished in our culture all of the time. Most of the women I know who have come to me, they've gone and seen a bunch of people who, you know, either dismiss their concerns or don't care about their concerns, they get thrown into the it's normal, or they prescribe outdated information. And certainly, most people don't understand this, the, the way that whole body movement, how you move all of the time, how, you, how your tension up here contributes to your pelvic floor problem, that these things are not part of the solution when we have these kinds of problems. Um, and so I think it's really important, especially because we're generally coming from that place, that we really bring a heart-centered approach to our pelvic floor healing when we look at restoring the connection, not just the physical connection, but the emotional connection as well. And I find that it takes both. <laughs> so I have some women who do heart body method and they're like, you know, there's a whole module on, on the root, on the pelvis. And 
you know, and sometimes they'll go through the course the first time and they're like, yeah, so I'm going to just like do the basics, but I don't really want to dig in. Like it's too much or like, or I'm doing this and like, I don't, I can't even feel this part of my body. And then they come back. So then they, they keep working in their bodies. They keep showing up. They keep going out for walks. They keep doing the corrective exercises. They keep doing the mindful meditations. And then they suddenly find that they're ready. And so they can go back to that and they can be like, oh, oh, like this is what's here and this is who I am. And it makes an incredible, incredible difference. Um, and that's why, I mean, I think that's really why this intersection of whole body movement, which absolutely changes your life and changes the stuff you're dealing with, your physical problems, like it, ah, it's so missing. It's so missing from the education about the body um, because we are steeped in a really sedentary culture. Uh, so we're kind of viewing everything from that framework and it's sort of like, yes, we can continue on in our very sedentary ways and, um, and deal with health through surgery, you know, deal with health through pills when there's so much that we can do if we learn new movement habits. And I find that, um, especially for maybe if you're feeling disconnected from your body or if you have particularly sensitive, um, or if you just really want like your, your physical experience to be about the fullness of you in your life, that not only do we need those whole body movements, but we need, we need the heart-centered stuff, that we need to hold it in that container in order to really um, experience and bring restoration. All right, so that's a bit about your pelvic floor.